name is Tracy Evans Maselli, and I'm with the New England Consortium for Deaf Alliance for Free Choices. And I've been asked to chat with you today regarding transition CVI. And I have to tell you, this is sort of a 360 for me because I came out of the world of early intervention and early childhood. That's what my doctorate's in, and that's where my heart and soul sort of started. And now I've really sort of come to the other end of this piece, um, more related to my job and what those requirements are, but I've learned a lot about, along the way of thinking about children and students that I started out with that were very young, and where are they today as it relates to being in those teen years or the adult world. So um, just want to give you a little example of a fellow that I met about three years ago. Um, his name is Adam. He doesn't live in Massachusetts, but it's the state that has story land, so you can figure it out. <laughs> and I was um, called with our, my ed consultant from New Hampshire called me, Christy Mars, and she said, I really need your help. And I said, what's going on? And she said, I got a referral on a kiddo. He's due to turn 21 in three months, <laughs> and they want you to come in, and they want to provide a consultation regarding transition and what they need to be doing. So I thought, oh, God. You know, so um, drove up to Storyland and um, went into this school. The classroom was as far back in this high school as it possibly could be. Um, and I saw most of the adults in the class either sitting around chit-chatting with each other um, or they were kind of off and about and doing certain tasks, either on the computer or whatever. A lot of the students didn't have any materials in front of them, weren't engaged in anything really meaningful. So we went through all the records, and basically, here was a kiddo. Um, so picture, from my perspective, um, here is a man. He is a young man. He's soon to turn 20 year, 21. He's in a wheelchair. I believe his issue is related to meningitis around age three. He has his head completely down. He's, his arms are sort of contracted upwards, and he has hearing aids. So the first thing I said was, let me see his IP, and I'm kind of flipping through these um, different kinds of the, what they call objectives. And the next question I said was, where's his teacher that visually impaired? And the response was, he hasn't had one for the last seven years. Oh. That's what I did. And it was one of those sort of cold New England days as I drove home, and I'm calling my ed consultant saying, Christine, this is like, this is the biggest nightmare. This is exactly what we don't do for kids. So picture this individual for the last six or seven years in a wheelchair, and um, the primary diagnosis was cortical visual impairment, and he has had no intervention. And also picture the fact that for the first three years of his life, he had normal vision. So perhaps there was a window that we could have <coughs> tagged onto and grasped onto and held onto to bring his vision much further. But at this point in his life, he really had no reason to look. So um, he's home now. He's living with his mom and dad. Occasionally, he goes out to different activities with them. But in terms of where he could have gone, um, I, it's this, you know, I was talking to Barry, you have these cases or these kids or young adults or adults in your head that stay with you. This individual has stayed with me for a really long time. So I'd like to, um, again, show you a couple of stories before I jump into this. This is, um, for those of you who want a little more dabbling in CDI, I encourage you to look at West Virginia Deaf Line Project. They have a really nice website with different aspects of CDI on there. And this is a case of a fellow, Dustin. And he brings up to me a whole sort of notion of the more I know, the more I realize what I don't know. And um, so Dustin's background is that he has a diagnosis, he's 17 years old, he has a diagnosis of high myopia and CDI as a result of intracranial brain hemorrhage shortly after birth, associated seizures and hydrocephalus. Okay. Now, most of us don't like to be videotaped, not that. So I'm not saying that the conversation this individual had is 110% appropriate, <coughs> but I watched this over and over and over again. As I was observing this particular student, first I kept thinking to myself, he can tell us what he sees. I work with many children, they can't tell us that. So let's hope this works. The person is walking with Dustin, and he's going through um, 
this entire uh, is on campus and is going through this entire sort of narrative of what he sees. So she's asking him to tell her what he's seeing. Now, what you didn't see at the beginning is most of the time he has his head down when he's talking to her, but she has to cue him, tell me what you see. He isn't automatically going to look up and do that. So he's able to tell her, I see the playground to my left. As he starts approaching the sidewalk intersection here, he, he's able to tell her, I'm at an intersection. She says, what do you see way off in the distance? And he says, I see a bus. There's a yellow bus way off in the distance. Okay. What he does is he describes, as he's moving along, everything on his left side. He doesn't describe anything on his right side. So for me, when I think about Dustin in transition, I think he's being assessed and he's getting instruction in a familiar environment, okay? When you have these individuals, again, move to adult services, they're in a whole vast array of unfamiliar environments, but yet no one's really gone in and sort of tested that and checked it out. So again, she stops him at this point and asks him, tell me what you just did, where did you notice things, and he kept saying left, 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 and then he said, oh, you're correct, he said, I didn't see anything on my way. So just an example of how it's really easy for individuals who are in these whole host of different environments um, in, in schools and classrooms, but yet we would really forget to take them out of that realm. So I wanted to bring your attention as we talk about transition to the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed Advisory on Transition. The advisory states the ultimate goal of all professional endeavors in special education is to prepare students with disabilities for adult life. So again, it's the ultimate goal of all professional endeavors in special education, yet it's the last thing we focus on. It's the end of the journey. And I know to some of you, I'm preaching to the choir, but it, it just is really, um, when I read this statement, I thought we really aren't putting the resources that we need to into this population. When I look at our deaf-blind census, about 240 kids in Massachusetts, half of that population is the age 14 to 21. And I would say that most state agencies do not get involved with those kids until they're often 19, 20, or just about ready to leave. Again, looking at the federal mandate around the IDEA, Transition should be a set of coordinated activities with a results-oriented process set to facilitate a student's movement from school to post-school activities. So this means that for every student, the transition planning process needs to be done in a purposeful, scheduled, and organized way to ensure an individualized, meaningful learning experience. And I guess the lesson for me on this is that to do transition, to facilitate successful transition for young adults takes time, it costs money, and there are basic ingredients that have to be put in place, and it, it isn't something that can be done quickly. When we look at the top predictors for successful transition from school to employment for youth with disabilities, here are some of the top predictors of success, and they, they kind of surprised me a little bit. Obviously, employment training and work experiences in high school, and that work experience piece can be holding a real job, or it can be doing pre-vocational activities. So it really sort of hits the gamut. And then last bullet here is high parental expectations. <coughs> so for many of the students that I work with, many of the parents don't have those high expectations. They don't even know what to dream for. And then when we look at significant variables that impact successful transition for youth, we look again at early and recent work experiences, completion of a post-secondary program. Now that could be also a summer experience after they've graduated, um, an experience at HKNC, 
It could be a training at the Carroll Center in the summer. So it doesn't have to be that they go on to college, but there needs to be something, again, to supplement post-school. The top impediments to successful transition are difficulty with transportation. We see that across the board. Lack of independent travel skills or navigation or negotiation skills, as Meg and I were chatting about, and also issues related to social skills. We talked a little bit about this whole transition team piece, but I just wanted to kind of outline thinking about students that have CDI. We've been doing a lot of work with parents around the person-centered planning process. How many people are familiar with person-centered planning? Okay, so some of you are not. So in general, it involves sitting down with the parent at the beginning and really asking the parent, what are your dreams for your child? Where do you want to see your child in the future? What would, um, what would the picture look like if you were to envision your young adult um, and being happy and contented and engaged meaningfully? So you take that information and it should drive that transition planning process in the classroom. I would suggest that it's important to use the CVI parent interview to add to that information so that it's clear what parents are perceiving related to their child's vision. And, you know, I, I think that really looking at um, the parent interview, I, I think it's really given a, a great deal of rich information regarding um, the child's background, the history, and the performance. Much of that information, again, can be used to drive that transition plan. Now, the classroom teacher, I know it varies from classroom to classroom, district to district, school to school. But we really want to look at teachers implementing those strategies, but making sure that the adaptations are in place relative to those CDI characteristics. Now, I just want to mention, we've, we've talked about characteristics, CDI characteristics, for two days now. Um, Christine Roman reports that there are 10 of them that she's based on her work. And for me, it's really informed me around intervention. But again, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know, maybe someday there'll be 14 <laughs> CVI characteristics, or 22, I don't know. But for me, I'm, when I look at intervention, I'm focused on those 10 at the moment. So the vision teacher, we really want to make sure that that vision teacher is involved in the team around transition, obviously has knowledge in terms of ocular issues, but I would submit that if you're going to use the CVI range, and it is referred to as the CVI range, it's not the Roman scale, it's not the Roman range, it's the CVI range, Christine Roman, 2007. Don't kill the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's really important that as TVIs or individuals in the field using that tool, that you are trained appropriately. You should at least be able to have strong inner rate of reliability that the child is at least in phase one, phase two, phase three. And I will tell you, I see people all the time, I will score the child maybe a three or four on the range, and I see people scoring seven, eight, and nine. That tells me there's a problem. People are using that tool. Um, inappropriately. So obviously the vision teacher is going to work on direct service, consultation, and really kind of look at that whole piece as it relates to transition. And then I see folks like you all at the um, at MCB to really look at eligibility and availability resources, but also really hit home for families, or at least be aware that families are struggling with moving from mandated services into adult world that's very, very different when it comes to those supports. So the transition team, I know you all have heard a little bit about all the team process and collaboration. I struggle with this a lot. I feel as educators and often as human service folks, we are not taught, we're not trained in good consultation skills. We don't know how to deal with conflict or disagreements in opinion. We don't know how to support one another. We tend to all, all be sort of off on our own. So I really feel if, if folks can think about contributing to the process, but then also relying on others. Those are really the two big characteristics around collaboration. So when we're thinking about a successful transition plan, these 
are sort of the checkoffs that you want to think about as you're planning for transition. That there's a vision for the future, often developed within the person-centered planning process. Parents and key players are involved so that MCD and MCDHH are at the table as early as possible. I know you all have really strained caseloads, and I can't tell you how appreciative I am of the time and resources that Commissioner Sainer and MCV has put forth for this training today, but you folks know what happens beyond 21. You've got that realm that you can bring to that transition experience and to that team, and your voice is really, really important and a huge support for families. Um, the other thing is, again, thinking about documenting the um, individual's information. So it might be a vocational pro uh, profile that's done or a portfolio. You're looking at information related to transition assessments as school work, living, and leisure. Um, we already talked about assistive technology. Whenever possible, infusing choice making in, the, in that student's life um, as it relates to self-determination. Connecting to the general ed curriculum and uh, expanded core curriculum, transportation needs, environmental assessment, and career exploration. So when you think about all these, this is just an, a schematic. I'm not going to obviously like glaze everybody over with this, but as you think about those key aspects of what makes a transition successful, think about where you can help that team think about the CBI characteristics and where those adaptations need to be made. So they may already be done in school, but what's going to happen when that individual is in a group living situation? Okay. So as you go through these, you can look at the asterisks indicate that's where you really look at the aspects around the characteristics. Um, shared work start work. Are any of you familiar with that site? Okay, um, sharedworks.org is a federal project. There's a lot coming out. Um, I would encourage folks to take a look at all that information online. There's probably going to be some CDI information in there pretty soon as it relates to transition. We've modified some of the CDI pieces in Connecticut and we're adapting that for Massachusetts. I hope to have that done by the end of December. And I'll make sure that that's disseminated to MCD folks. So, um,
and say, perhaps if we had involved those parents earlier and they had stronger advocacy skills and had a better understanding of their child, they may feel more engaged in the system. Um, I know it works both ways, and there are cases where you'll see parents that are highly engaged, highly motivated, and really take on um, and embrace the whole notion of kind of moving forward and are excited about New Horizons, and there are other families that want absolutely no part of it. And um, yeah, I, I would definitely say that that's an issue. But it's interesting for me, I, I keep going back to, um, some of you may know a fellow Mark Dunning, who's a dad, and he does an incredible amount of work in the area of Usher syndrome. His daughter, Bella, has Usher's. And Mark has this an unbelievable way of kind of conveying what a lot of parents think and worry about. And he, he always answers the question, what do parents want? What do most parents want for their child as they grow and they mature? Like what, what kind of drives them? And his response was just this one simple word, hope. They want to know that their child is going to be safe and happy and well cared for and living a meaningful life. And it, that's just, you know, I do think it's unfortunate when we see families like that because I feel like something happened along the way, whether they lost trust with someone. Um, and then when you see them at that transition age, they're angry often, they're negative, they can't, they can't envision any kind of positive future for their child. And I feel like something's, something's not right with that because that's part of our job to kind of help them move along that journey. So that's just my soapbox for today. Mm -hmm. um, this is a timeline that we use around transition for our support services that we give to teams and to families and to agencies. So we really encourage, again, looking at that age 12 to 14. So I've gone through and just highlighted, again, we don't have enough time this afternoon, but I've just highlighted those areas where you're going to think about what's going on related to CDI assessment and the characteristics. So conducting a personal learning profile checklist, you want to make sure you have information in there about the, the child's um, visual abilities and um, relative to the characteristics as well. Designing individualized employment for students, thinking about how would you arrange or modify that environment so that that individual can be more independent. So all along this continuum, you'll see just different areas. Um, revisiting the person centered planning goals on the IP, transition planning specific, being really specific about what those adaptations and modifications are. Okay. So, this is just an example of looking at the characteristics and thinking about the areas of home, school, work, community, social interactions. I would argue this is, we have to get to this level of detail when we're talking about transition planning. Because we know the student well, but they're moving into a realm of working with people who are caring for them, often physically, emotionally, and they don't have that information. They don't have the history with the student. So I would really hope that transition teams take the time to fill in this grid and actually put in the specific modifications or adaptations that that student needs. All of the information around um, that, that was mentioned around mobility that Michelle Antonarelli talked about, that Willie Hirsch talked about. I mean, the, all of that needs to be sprinkled in a grid like this so that you can pass it on to that receiving agency. So again, looking at the parameters around home, school, work, community, and social interactions. Um, and then looking at maybe once the individual transitions or even planning, you could do this um, certainly ahead of time, come up with sort of a mock work schedule. Have the team kind of play around with that and think about this is the particular job this student may be going to and these are the areas that we're going to have to consider. Um, the individual arrives at work. There's a locker. They have to hang up their coat. They have to put their lunch in the refrigerator. What's that, Meg? How do they arrive? Exactly. How do they arrive? How do they, how do they even get there? And then once they either arrive in a van, a car, or a bus, how do they get to the front door? You know, are there things that we can do in the environment to make that whole process easier and more independent? So then thinking there might be a work meeting or a morning meeting where everybody gets together and they plan out the day, even locating their workspace and their chair, locating their work materials, 
even knowing who's in the room and greeting your peers or coworkers, um, that's another issue. Thinking about the break area and the snack area. So I would argue that we really have to get to this level of detail to make transition successful. <coughs> So this is the transition planning form that DESE uses, and I would, under where it says disability-related needs, I would put information relative to CVI and the necessary modifications and adaptations in this section. Okay. Any of you um, who've had experience working with this form, have you been doing that? Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much where you put it. Now, I would also that argue that's filled out by the school district. Right. Right. That's not filled out by MCD or any way, shape, or form. Okay. If, the discussion. Right. So if you were a TBI, though, nope. I would argue don't say, I, you don't have to stay in that little box. I would say see attached. And you can add a grid with the modifications in it so that it's really spelled out. And that you see anything you can see. Anybody have a question or comment? Okay. So, we're engaged in a uh, transition team training initiative that we just ended our first year. We had three teams in Connecticut, three in Massachusetts, and then one in New Hampshire. We're probably going to move up to about 25 teams starting in September. What this involved was monthly team meetings and then interim webinars also each month that were topic related uh, as specific to transition. And there were things like developing a transition plan, person center planning, how do you access transit, uh, transportation, um, different ideas about work sampling. So what we did was we brought these teams together on a monthly basis. It was an opportunity for them to plan. And what we're going to be doing is working through that whole sort of CDI transition grid that I just showed you for some of the students that we have that have cortical visual impairment. And I'm more than welcome, uh, more, I just want to welcome any of you, if you already have teams that you're engaged in and if you'd like to participate in this training, let me know. We'll be doing the training here monthly. And I'm looking for teams anywhere from age 14 to 21, obviously in Massachusetts. We really encourage full team participation, but if it's only, say, a TBI or an MCV worker and a teacher, an MCV person and a parent, we would also welcome that. So, we really found that that you have to get really, really intensive around transition and have ongoing discussion on a regular basis for it to work. On that transition form that the school fills out, is that telling about what the student needs when they transition or what our supports are involved? Correct. So if, if, if a parent sees that or discusses that and sees there's something not in it, do they then bring it up? Why isn't orientation mobility in this? Correct. Okay. Correct. Mm -hmm. Just curious. How many teams are you on? Me, personally? It <laughs> depends on the day. Mm -hmm. um, we have ed consultants in four states. We're, we're not uh, written into the IEP. So our job actually is, is federal, is to work ourselves out of a job. So ultimately, we want that team to take best practices around transition and do that work on their own. Right. So some of the teams that we've been working with this year, they don't need us anymore. I've got three teams at American School for the Deaf in Connecticut, and I'm telling you, I thought I was going to kill those people at the beginning of the year, and they're, like, I just want to adopt all of them. They, they got it. It took them a while. I had to feed them. <laughs> um, but they, they really got it, and they're starting to really apply it with other students as well. Well, there's no for the, but you're doing it with the deaf line folks. You're not doing it with other groups like vision. No, that's there's what no I'm saying. Like you no, but what I'm saying is if you have teams of students that have only vision loss, I would welcome that. Because for me, what I'm able to kind of reflect back on is we're looking at a system wide approach. And many of you will come in contact with those individuals that do have vision and hearing and at least um, be able to take that information and pass it forward. So, okay. Question? Do you have any special challenges around working with families for whom English is a second language? Oh, yeah. Um, we, um, I'm, we're kind of lucky lately. We've had a lot of Indian families um, come into our area, but we're lucky our family specialists 
in Connecticut knows six lang languages, so I keep her really busy. Um, so that sort of solves that problem, but yeah, a lot of the materials we have to either search for the translation. Uh, there's a lot of technology that we use in order to do that, but yeah, it's a struggle. I mean, it's also a cultural issue. Yeah. Um, many of our families say, why do I have to do this? He's, you know, he's not going anywhere, he's staying here. Yeah. They don't even think of their student, their child leaving. Or they trust that the school district is doing exactly what they need to do. Correct. So, or they feel that advocating is being negative and yeah, they don't want to be, um, they're questioning and it's totally not part of the culture. <coughs> sampling and having opportunities to try out different jobs and you know I know that Perkins has been working really hard on developing a program around that that for that very reason um, and I think that for me I see also the population that students that have more multiple disabilities they're not even afford, afforded sometimes the same opportunities and it's really unfortunate because um, I'll, I'll, I'll close, I'm sorry, that there's this one um, video I wanted to show you. If you ever, again, go on West Virginia Deafblind Project and take a look at a video clip of Mercedes, and it's just a fabulous example of a young lady that had all the great, just really great things in place for her to be successful. But I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I, again, I know that this is tough work. It's it's detailed work. It requires resources. It requires commitment. But in the end, I think ultimately that's what we're mandated to do. That's why we're here. That's why the money's been um, allotted. It's our mandate to move forward and support this population. So thanks very much. Happy Friday.